not going to look at the immediately preceding verses. But the context, as always, really is important. And I think that particularly, and this is true of a lot of Paul's letters, we, we really have to look at the bigger picture of the letter so that we don't sort of get the wrong message, right? The, the message, if we just focus in on these verses, you know, could be summarized along the lines of pray better and speak better. Like, just let's be better prayers and better speakers. And, and it's true, that's what it's talking about, but there's a much bigger context than that. And if that's the entirety of what we take out of this, we've, I think, missed the main point. And, and like most of Paul's letters, there's, there's a, he starts out with glorious truths of what God has done in Christ. And then there's a point where the letter pivots and says, therefore, because all of these things are true, let's apply those practically to how we live our life. And so what I'd actually like to do before we begin in these verses, just because I think this is so important, is to do a quick fly-through of the book of Colossians, kind of looking at this structure that's there. And we begin, and I realize that may be a little small for some of you to see. Don't worry, just, just kind of follow the, it's the big picture of this, this image that's important. We begin with an introduction. And, and this arrow up is pointing that Paul is building to this, this pivot point. Uh, Paul talks about the gospel bearing fruit in them and his desires for them to continue to bear yet more fruit. Uh, he talks about how God delivered us. He transferred us to a new kingdom. He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and planted us in his kingdom of light. He talks about how Christ is preeminent over all creation. And Christ is the head of the church, the body. He talks about how Christ has reconciled us to himself by his work on the cross. And uh, God's mystery is revealed, the mystery of, of who Christ is and Christ in us, the hope of glory. And mystery, again, is, it's not, it, it just means something that God has been revealing over time, that we didn't know everything from the beginning. It talks about how Jesus is fully God and is counteracting some of the apparently wrong things that the Colossians were hearing. And how we were dead in our sins, but God canceled our debt. And the, the, the wonderful phrase there, nailing our record of debt to the cross. And Christ is our hope, not man-made regulations. And so, so all of these truths that we've seen and Paul talks about. And then we get to the pivot point in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. And I'd actually like to read this, the whole, the whole verse, and it's kind of summarized what's up there. But Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, and there's been so much time talking about how Christ has been raised, he's the firstborn. If you have been raised with Christ, if you're in Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So a lot of what's been talked about is how we, if we are in Christ, Christ, it's like we are in him, we, we, as it says, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. As Christ is in heaven, we will be following him. He will be raising us in him. Um, our life, our, really, our real life is with him, not just a life in this world. And then therefore, so, so it says on the slide here, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And because of that, Therefore, we should set our minds at things that are above, not things that are on earth. And then really the rest of the book is, okay, if this is all true, how does this work itself out practically in, in many different areas? So then we sort of go down uh, in practical application, and there were commands to put off, to put to death what is earthly in you. There were commands to put on the graces of the Christian life, and there's just long lists of things that that means. There were commands for church body life. Uh, bear with one another, forgive one another, love one another, those kinds of things. There were commands for Christian households, fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, children. 
Uh, commands also for work relationships and other, other sometimes households, sometimes external relationships. And then that brings us to what we'll be talking about today. There's some commands about prayer, commands for interacting with outsiders. And then there is the letter conclusion, which we won't be covering today. Now, now for some of you, you know, I'm using the word commands here, and, and I know sometimes we bristle a little bit, but, but the reality is these are, these are things that are imperatives. They're, they're him saying, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. Right? These are things that, that God, through the Apostle Paul, is telling us that we should be following. But we have to remember this, this picture here, this context. We can't just take that command in isolation and just say, well, be better prayers. Well, the whole reason for this is because there is a heavenly reality that is more eternal than the earthly reality that we see before us. And because of that, because of what Christ has done and how we are related to that, that is the reason that all of these sort of commands, all of these, the way we should live should be there. And in fact, as we'll see today, that is the motivation that enables us to actually want to do these things. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So let's, let's pray before we begin and, and dive in at, in chapter 4, verse 2. Father, as always, we come before you and we know that we need your help. We physically probably need your help and are, are tired maybe, maybe worn out from uh, different things. Maybe we didn't sleep well last night. Whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would give us strength, that your spirit would be at work, that you would encourage us, um, that you would convict us where we need to be convicted, that you would help us again to grasp the big picture of what you have done for your people, and that we would, in response to that, and in rejoicing in the status that you have amazingly given us, that we would have a desire to live life according to the way that you have prescribed. Help us as we look at this. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so okay, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Let me go ahead and read this, and we'll work our, our way through. And I'm, I'm going to be... Um, mostly reading from the English Standard. Well, we'll be reading from the English Standard, but mostly uh, using that as I preach here. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So I'm going to give you an outline. We're basically going to work through this outline, and there's fundamentally two main topics here. One is prayer, and one is interaction with outsiders. So... Let's first look at prayer, and that's really starting there in verse 2. Uh, and Paul first gives, um, in verse 2 itself, some directions about the way in which we should pray, or some, somewhat of what our attitude is. He says at the beginning of verse 2, um, to continue steadfastly. Other versions say, continue earnestly, devote yourselves to. And the idea here is that we should be exerting significant ongoing effort in prayer. Uh, Pastor Steve has talked a number of times about the parable of the importunate widow. widow. And I know he's defined that, uh, but that's the widow who basically wouldn't stop bug bugging the judge. This is a parable that Jesus gave. The widow who wouldn't stop bugging a judge for justice. And the judge finally said, look, I don't care about your case. I don't care about justice. I'm going to give you what you want because you're not stopping asking me for it. And Jesus gave that parable as an encouragement to us, not about the nature of who God is. God is not like that you know, relatively wicked judge, but an encouragement us to continually come to God in prayer, even if we don't see immediate answers. Now, and the, the problem here is that this, and then with many other things we're going to talk about, I can just say, okay, well, pray earnestly. 
And, and you might sit here and say, yeah, that's a good idea. But, but praying, saying pray more, pray better, doesn't really provide the motivation to do so. Uh, but the motivation becomes a little more clear when we see the next point, which is that we should be alert or watchful in our prayers. The word there means to keep awake or keep alert. It's the same word that was used in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, when Jesus said to his disciples as he was about to be wrestling with God, uh, you know, praying to the Father, um, saying, if this cup can be taken from me. And he said to the disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. By the way, I realized I just said something that probably is not really correct. When I said Jesus would be wrestling with God, it, you know, the Trinity is hard to deal with sometimes. Just to be clear, Jesus is God. Jesus was wrestling in prayer with his Father. Um, anyway, that, that's just wanted to, to catch that. So, but Jesus said, Watch with me. We also see in 1 Peter 5 8, it says, Be sober minded, be watchful. And why is that? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's the idea here, is that we're watchful, we're alert in prayer. The, the example came to mind of something that happened recently in our house when Noah and Carol and Charlie came to live with us shortly after Charlie was born uh, because of, um, at the time, Carol's struggling with some things and they were living with us. And we got there and our dog, Sullivan, realized there is a new baby human in this house that needs to be protected. And Sullivan just had to always know what was going on to the point of wanting to jump in the, the cradle with Charlie and just, you know, if somebody went to pick up Charlie, Sullivan like is almost ready to protect Charlie. And, and so Sullivan was not relaxed, let's say, during that time period. He was very, very alert because he perceived great danger coming to Charlie by his mom, you know, picking her up to, picking him up to feed him or something. Um, but, but that picture of alertness is, you know, that, that's kind of, I think, what Paul is getting at here is the idea that we have to realize that there is more than just what meets the eye. Um, and there are things that we do need to be alert about, and, and prayer is involved with that. So let me... Um, you know, this, this brings us back to that, that pivot point where we're talking about there's things that are above and things that are on earth. And if we are entirely focused on earthly things, we are going to miss a lot of what it is that in prayer we actually do need to be alert about. So what things above realities are out there that would make sense for us to be alert about in our prayer? Um, one thing is that if, as believers, our life is not our own. We are bought with a price, Right? If that is true, then that means there's all kinds of, of ramifications of that in our living. Um, knowing that God is at work growing his eternal kingdom, right? If that is true, that is going to affect our prayer. It is going to affect how we think about people. Um, it's going to affect sort of what we desire. Um, Here's another truth, that Christ is reigning at the right hand of God the Father. We just um, had read that earlier today. Um, that is a truth, and that is something that, that should make us be aware in prayer. We just read in 1 Peter 5, 8 of a, of a danger to be alert about, and that there's an adversary, the devil, roaring about like, uh, roaring, or roaming about like a roaring lion. And he does definitely not want to see God's kingdom grow. Um, there are some things that we do that have eternal ramifications. Uh, every person we know is either in Christ or not with eternal ramifications. These are all uh, things above realities that when we live our lives recognizing they're true, it's going to give us sort of a different view and it's going to make us alert and aware in prayer in a way that we aren't if... if Prayer is just a thing that we do because we're supposed to before we eat, right? You know, that, that's something I struggle with sometimes, um, just practically. If we're living our lives with the things that are on earth mindset, we're going to, like many millions of others around us, be focused only on everyday things from an only earthly point of view. 
Um, now, when we take this big picture view of things, we realize there's many things we can't do ourselves and where we need God's work. So I'd like you to think for a moment in your life. As, you, as we're thinking about prayer, you know, some of this is recognizing where is it that we really need God to be doing something? Um, what is something where you are in need of God's working in your life or in the life of someone around you? And I really want you to think of something, something where you recognize, I cannot make this happen. I need God's work in your own life or the life of someone around you. Maybe it's to be able to resist a temptation to sin. Maybe it's to respond in the right way in a situation where, we, where you normally respond the wrong way. Maybe it's just to be able to hold it together. You know, which probably when you step back really means needing the Lord to hold it together for you and for you to be able to trust him to do that. Uh, maybe it's for someone we love to recognize the love and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and come to faith in him. Uh, maybe it's just for all these kinds of things, not just in us, but our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and, and, you know, there's many, many things where we're like that. We are helpless among, by ourselves, apart from God's working, especially the things that are above things, the, the, the important eternal things. That is where God must be at work uh, for eternal good to happen. Paul continues here and he says, with thanksgiving. And we talk a lot about this. I'm not going to spend much time this morning, but I, I, it's in the text. We want to point it out. Our prayer should include regular thanksgiving for what God has done. And I think some of this is because prayer is not just like, you know, if, if those of you that maybe do online grocery ordering at Kroger, and you just sort of click and request things and they show up. That, that is not the nature of prayer with our Lord and Savior. It is a relational kind of thing that is happening. Um, and so just asking for things, just, you know, putting in an order is not, is not sort of what comes from being one, being united with Christ and having our life be wrapped up in what he has done for us. So, so thanksgiving is certainly a part of that. And, and you've probably heard us talk about the acronym ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Generally, prayer you know, should involve all of these. And, and even as we pray in the morning, we try to, to involve all of those things. So, so in verse 2, we see very specific kind of instruction about attitudes towards prayer. But then in verse 3 um, and 4, we get Paul's prayer requests. This is kind of like Paul's at our, our prayer meeting. He pops in one day, the Apostle Paul, he's like, hey, I've got a prayer request, and, and here's Paul's prayer request that he gives. And there's two specific requests. One is that God would open doors for them, that he would open a door for the word. We see that in verse 3. And it is uh, to declare the word. That's what he's saying, to speak the mystery of Christ. And he's, he mentions that he's in chains. And at first I thought, okay, why does Paul mention this here? It's kind of like, by the way, I'm in chains, in case you didn't know. I, I don't think that's the idea. I think there's a very practical aspect, is that he's in chains, and for him to declare the word to anybody besides maybe the, jail, the jailers or the soldiers, I think it was house arrest at this point, that are with him, uh, would require God to do something. And so I think part of his prayer request is, that the chains could somehow be released so that he would have more access to be able to, to do that. But, but nonetheless, he's, he's praying that God would open a door for the word. But then very interestingly, he then continues and that Paul basically says, I want to be able to represent the gospel well. We see that in verse four where he says, that I may make it clear, meaning the mystery of God in Christ, the gospel as I ought to speak. In a parallel passage in Ephesians 6, um, Paul, in a very similar kind of style letter to the Ephesians, says in verses 18 through 20, praying also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, when you think about this, remember, again, this is the apostle, Paul, the guy that the Lord Jesus taught 
directly and wanted and sent and said, I am sending you to the Gentiles. This is sort of the first missionary church planter that was an apostle. And he'd been doing this at the point he wrote this letter probably for about 30 years. And he is still saying, I need God's help to be skilled and to present the gospel well. If there's anybody who knew how to do it, it was Paul, yet he still asked for prayer along these lines. Now, if you think about these two requests, that God would open doors and that <clears throat> we'd be able to make it clear to others, these certainly are pro- the primary requests of any church planting missionary. Um, I've personally interacted with some missionaries working in very difficult places and heard their heart desires and struggles. And much of what they have said essentially does funnel down to these two ideas, that God would open fruitful doors of opportunity and that they themselves would have the ability and the wisdom needed to explain the, the gospel and disciple others well in their particular context. And both of those things are needed. So while you know, this would apply to missionary church planters, um, most of us in this room are not missionary church planters, right? So how does it apply to us? I don't think the takeaway is, well, here's Paul's prayer request. He's no longer living, so it's not really relevant, right? That doesn't make sense. Um, rather, I think it is a concise summary of at least two things that we should be in prayer about for those that we know that are doing mission work, but but I'll talk a minute, there, there's also relevance to us. But, but again, that, that God would open fruitful doors of opportunity and that they would be able to evangelize and disciple well in their context. When you step back and you look at these two things, we have here another picture of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility kind of combined together. Paul realizes that without God's door opening, anything that he would do would be fruitless. Without God giving access to people and without God opening up their hearts to respond to what he says, it's, it's not going to have any effect. But at the same time, we see Paul's desire to do it well. To, to bear, he feels a level of personal responsibility or burden to be able to share the gospel in a way that, that would be good and helpful to people. Now, don't we find ourselves in situations like this all the time? Um, where we know that we cannot do anything, or maybe what you even thought about before, where I can't do this without God's work. But at the same time, we feel a responsibility to sort of to do our part in this well. Um, that's true of every single sermon that's ever been preached. That's true of every single Sunday school lesson. And, and much of what we seek to do spiritually, among others, among brothers and sisters, family members, um, it falls in these categories where we, we have to have God work, but at the same time, we feel a personal burden. It would certainly be a foolish pastor or teacher who would think to themselves, well, everything's based on God's sovereign working, so it really doesn't matter whether I prepare at all, so I'm just going to wing it. I did that once in high school. I can tell you that story sometime. Trust me, that doesn't work, (laughs) at least for me. Um, It would also be a foolish pastor or teacher would think, everything depends on my skill as an order, and that 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 is the essence of what's going on, without a recognition that there is a need for God's spirit to be at work in order to have any real impact on anyone. This is true, like I said, not just for preaching and teaching, but for many other things in life. Uh, let, just to give you an example, let's say you need to have a difficult conversation with a friend and you feel, I kind of need to confront them about something. We've talked about biblical confrontation before and sometimes these things happen. And you know, ultimately, that you need God to be working in their life in such a way that they will be able to listen and respond well to your encouragement or your confrontation. But at the same time, you feel a personal burden to do this well. Like, how do I say this in a way that's loving? And, and you know, you, you don't, and, and you have both of these. You need God to work and you also want to do it well. As we see here, praying for both of these things is good and appropriate. Now, let's take a step back and Again, not get lost in the details of, okay, pray more with this attitude, pray better. 
but to um, okay, sorry, somehow it's not advancing anymore. Oh, there we go. Okay. And, and again, let's bring this back to the why. Why is it that these things are even important or true? The reality is the extent that we, that we pray along these lines is a reflection of where our mind is set. As Paul puts it in Colossians 3.2, whether our minds are set on things that are above or things that are on the earth, there is a heavenly reality which is actually more permanent and therefore a more permanent reality than anything that we see directly before our eyes. In other words, we tend to think that what we see is real and what God tells us about what it, the, the heavenly realities, the spiritual realities, that those are sort of less real. When the actual situation is those things, we, those things are permanent. Those things are eternal. What we see is real, but it will pass away. It is, it is sort of a temporary situation. If we go through life primarily with an earthly mindset, then prayer is generally going to be an afterthought. That's just kind of the natural way we would do it. Something we do because we have to, not because we want to or feel a need to. But if we recognize that there's actually a lot, going, a lot going on in the spiritual world, that we're helpless apart from God, and that, there, that long-term there are eternal consequences to things, then, then suddenly praying the way Paul says here, is something we will want to do. It'll, it'll become more natural, and it's really the motivation for it. So let's move on to the second part of this, which is interaction with outsiders. So Paul transitions essentially from asking for prayer about his interaction with outsiders to uh, providing some instruction to them about how they should be interacting with outsiders. And... Um, he begins by saying, with wisdom. In, in verse 5, he says, to walk with wisdom towards outsiders. And by outsiders, just to be clear, Paul's referring to those who are not believers in Christ, those who are not Christians. Um, Jesus gave some advice along these lines in Matthew 10, verse 16, where he said, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Notice that Jesus says to be as wise as serpents. Some translations use the word shrewd. And that implies a level of understanding of the way the world works, of outsiders, of engaging with outsiders. And so we are called to do that, yet we are to do it in a way that we are innocent as doves. In our efforts to be shrewd, we shouldn't uh, simply become like outsiders, especially in the way that we operate, in the way he's going to continue here. He continues there and he says in the second part of verse 5, making the best use of the time. Making the best use, the, the, the word literally means to buy up, to buy up the opportunity. Um, from a resource called Word Study, it says the word generally means to buy up, to buy all that is anywhere to be bought and to not allow the suitable moment, a suitable moment to pass by unheeded, but to make it one's own. Um, for those of you that have played Monopoly, that's generally a pretty good strategy in Monopoly, is you buy as much stuff as you can get, because if you pass up something, you'll later wish you had it. It's probably not a good strategy in life. It's a good strategy in the game of Monopoly. Um, but he's saying, buy up the time. In other words, when you have an opportunity, like, use it. It is a stewardship it's kind of an encouragement to, you might say, to step through that door or to go there when a situation or a topic has come up and, and you're kind of thinking, well, do I, do I kind of go there? Do I step through that door? Paul then moves on to a related topic where he's talking about our speech in verse 6. And, and I, I struggled a little bit to, to try to figure out, is Paul, is this a different topic completely? Or is this still relating to outsiders? And I think in context, Paul is primarily thinking of our interaction with outsiders, with unbelievers, but certainly a lot of this would apply 
to us speaking to, to one another as well. But our speech should always be gracious. What does gracious mean? Well, basically speaking in a manner that flows from the operation of God's grace in our lives. And as, as uh, Chase talked about in Sunday school, grace is God's unmerited favor. We have gotten favor from God that we do not deserve. So as we interact with others, we should be very much willing to extend that favor to others. Titus, or Paul in, in his book to Titus, um, maybe fleshes out this idea a little bit more where he says in Titus 3, 2, remind them to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Easy, right? <laughs> you know, I look at that and I think, oh boy, there's so many times I've failed to do that. And, you know, I suspect you may think the same thing. The good thing is, is again, we have to look at this big picture. This is not about, okay, perform well so that you have God's favor. This is, you have been given God's favor. You have been united with Christ, and therefore this is a response. When, when we're convicted of these things, I think we should be convicted. We should grow in them. That's why, why Paul wrote them here. But, but Christian, remember, when we fail, we have forgiveness. God can enable us to grow in these things. And, it, and life is not about just doing this better. Life is about recognizing what God has done and allowing that to flow through us as we interact with others. I think here of the fruit of the Spirit, you know, that this would be very much present in our communication. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, are those the kinds of things that characterize our speaking? You know, when somebody hears how you speak, are they able to say, I see the evidence of God's grace working in their heart? Probably that's not going to be the response of somebody, especially an outsider, somebody who doesn't know Christ. Uh, but they might, an outsider or a non-believer might be, say something like, there's something different and very good about the way that person speaks. Recently, um, I was actually very personally encouraged to find out that someone that I had been working with from another company on a project a while back was a believer who was very serious about his walk with Christ. I didn't know that explicitly when we were interacting together. But what I found encouraging is that as I thought back through those interactions and the way that he spoke, and there were some pretty, I'd say, tense kind of interpersonal situations going on there. And as I thought back to how that person spoke, it actually didn't surprise me that he was a believer because his, I would say his speech did seem to be filled with grace at times where that was probably difficult. And, and I just found that as a very encouraging thing of someone who I think was interacting with outsiders exactly along the line that Paul was talking about. And this was a completely work environment. There was no spiritual discussion of any kind happening here. But you know, that we can even in a completely secular environment operate in our speech in such a way that, that we're following what uh, Paul is saying here. Is it possible to be gracious in this way and still vehemently disagree with somebody? Sure. You know, we're not saying that being gracious means we agree with anything anybody would say, uh, but it's a question of how do we disagree? Do we do it in a gracious manner? So another question for you to think about in terms of application. You know, in what areas of your life do you find yourself being the least gracious in your speech toward others? Especially outsiders. Is it in the work context? Is it with your family? Is it in your online interactions? You know, that, that's an interesting one because it seems like, especially if you feel like it's semi-anonymous, at least from what I see, and I don't spend a lot of time reading these things, let's just say graciousness generally does not characterize online interaction. And I think, you know, you know what I mean. And, and there's certainly exceptions to that. But, but you know, in, in when you are interacting online, is graciousness a part of it? Uh, is it maybe with strangers that you see when you're out and about that you're never going to see again. You know, if you're like, I don't need to worry about them, right? There's different, probably all of us, maybe we have some places where 
we struggle with this more than others. Paul then says, seasoned with salt in the middle of verse 6. And I, I recently read about a scientific discovery that I would, thought I would share with you, and that is that salt is salty. Right? And the, the part that we all realize, actually, um, is that too much and it ruins the taste. One time I was helping to make some soup early in our marriage, and it said three uh, spoonfuls of salt. And table versus tea was kind of a technical detail I didn't really pinch into. <laughs> so, so I put three tablespoons of salt in. <laughs> and let's just say this was not the best tasting soup that we ever made. And you know, I learned that day that, that you know, pay attention to those details. Um, but you know, on the other end, if you don't have enough salt, there's a big lack, right? Things like oatmeal and grits. If you have no salt in your oatmeal and no salt in your grits, I actually know a guy who has salt, no salt in oatmeal, I, but to me that just tastes like you're eating texture. There's no actual taste. <laughs> it's just a, an experience of texture, right? But you get just the right amount, and it has a very positive impact, at least on those two foods. And that's generally true you know, across all the different foods. And, and that's, I think, why salt is probably a good analogy, is that you know, Paul is not saying just like absolutely go to the max on everything. You know, there's, there's a certain amount of saltiness that we should have, and I'm not using that in the modern sense of the word. You know, salty has sort of a very specific negative connotation. The biblical saltiness that Paul calls us to. Um, that, that sort of we should always be, I've, I've heard somebody uh, say it's like we're putting pebbles in people's shoes. You know, to an unbeliever, it's kind of like throwing little pieces of information out there that might kind of shake up their worldview a little bit, but they're, they're pebbles. They're not, you know, boulders that roll over them. They're, they're, they're this kind of a thing. I think that Paul almost had to be thinking of Jesus speaking about his followers being salt of the earth. And here's what Jesus said. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And then he continues, you're the light of the world. But, but Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. So we need to be ready to sprinkle some salt when needed. Um, you know, an example, I remember one time I was talking with, I think this happened to be a student of mine, and somehow the words came out of my mouth that was like, well, in the big picture, I don't know what I said, something, something like that. And the student said, you know, something like, well, what is the big picture anyway? Okay, there's, there's an opportunity, right? And, and sometimes throwing a little bit of salt into a conversation can then lead to, I think that did actually lead to a little bit more meaningful discussion than, than normal. Um, first Peter, Peter says in his letter, in uh, verse 3, verse 15, he says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. So it's very much aligned here with what Paul is saying. How do we prepare for these kinds of things, practically? I mean, some of that can come by uh, thinking through situations ahead of time. Probably most of that comes by being in a situation where at the moment we didn't really respond very well, we kind of got stuck. You know, maybe an opportunity came up and we fumbled around with something, and afterwards we thought, oh man, you know what, what I should have said is this. At least this is for me how this tends to work. But if we, if we remember that and learn from that, so next time we're in a similar circumstance, we maybe respond a little bit better, you know, that kind of a thing can happen. Um, knowing and being able to communicate what it is that we believe when somebody asks us about it, that actually takes some skill and some practice. If we've never s explained that to anybody, um, you know, I can get pretty mumble-mouthed about, blah, 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 and it's like, well, what, what it really is important here? Um, as an aside, uh, family devotions are actually one of the best ways, or one way that God has given, I should say, for us to prepare to be able to talk about spiritual things with people that aren't in our family. You know, if we are within our family, uh, especially if there are children involved, but maybe even if not, if we are talking about what God has said. We're talking about spiritual things. Sometimes we're teaching in that context, and that's a, that's a much lower threat context. 
Um, that is a very good sort of training ground for talking about these things with outsiders. And then finally, in the last part, we see, he says, so that, at the last part of verse 6, he says, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. In a sense, the idea is that our response is not a one-size-fits-all response as we're talking with people. Different people need different inputs. Uh, there's a, a well-known passage in Ephesians 4.29 that says, no, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that's, there's the context, that it may give grace to those who hear. There'll be different responses to different people in different situations. You know, sometimes we need to be confrontational or challenging, sometimes we need to be subtle, sometimes we need great boldness, sometimes we need to hold off in order to choose, a, choose our battles wisely. It takes wisdom, but, but tailoring our speech to the situation is appropriate. Now, as we've said, all of these are goals. Again, the message here is not pray better and speak better. The message is it's because of the spiritual realities, the heavenly realities being important, being more important than what we see, the things on earth, that therefore this is going to be important to us. There, there are going to be ramifications of our speech. We can have, you realize this, this week at work, you can say something that will be part of what God could use to have an eternal impact on somebody. That's, that's a lot bigger impact than writing a really good report for work or you know, whatever your work is. You know, physically caring for somebody if you're a nurse. You know, those are all really good things, but, but we can have eternal impact in our speech. So, again, I think the idea here is that there is a heavenly reality that makes interacting with outsiders much more important than it would be if we're just basing everything on what we see with our eyes. If this world were all that there is, if, there's n if nothing about the preeminence of Christ that Paul described in the first two chapters is true, then what we have here in these verses are basically helpful tips for being a nice person. And, and I say that a little facetiously, but I actually am afraid that, that there are many Christians that can see that's, that's why I'm at church, is because I can get helpful tips for how to live right. And that is not what church is about. That is not what God has created this body fundamentally to do. Um, We are here because of the gospel. We are here because of what God has done in our lives. We are responding to that as we live our lives with others. Uh, we are not here to become just better people. That, that is a much, much lower goal. And if that's all it is, then and it's kind of like, uh, this is like a club. And you can join, you cannot join, it's not that important. Um, what we are talking about is life and death, eternal realities. These are things that are worth live, orienting our lives around. These are things that are worth dying for if we have to because they are long-term, they are eternal. Um, these, this is not just, yeah, I, I kind of like getting together with people on Sunday morning and it's a good thing to do. Um, you know, we are, this is very, very important and serious. We have to realize in terms of outsiders that if they remain outsiders, there's eternal punishment waiting for them. That's not, you know, as much as we don't like to face that, we can't just pretend that's not true. But we also know that God is continually growing his kingdom, and he normally uses people like you and me to do it, which is pretty amazing, actually. What we're talking about here in terms of these verses is seeing outsiders as people who are to be respected and loved enough that we're willing to be gracious and appropriately salty with the intent of being part of what God may use to bring them into his kingdom. If you are here today as an outsider, as someone who is not truly in Christ, it's likely you haven't had much interest in what Paul has to say here. 
you probably don't resonate that much with the heavenly realities that we've talked about. And so therefore, your motivation for doing these is probably not super high. Uh, there may be some of you who are you know, also outsiders who aren't yet believers, but maybe you do kind of recognize, well, I've, I've heard these realities taught and I kind of think they're true, but you recognize this with great fear and anxiety because you've not yet put your faith in Christ and receive the free gift of forgiveness that he offers. And, and to you, I would say the same thing that we say many, many weeks, which is what Jesus says, where Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There is no need to fear. Come to Christ. Every one of us will do well to continually remember that there is much more going on than what we see with our eyes. God is at work. So let me leave you again with what we read at the beginning, at, at the, the, the pivot point of the book of Colossians, and really the, the point from which everything that we talked about today flows. Set your mind on things that are above, not things that are on earth. For your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. Lord, we need your help to be able to remember these things, to be able to go through life and to recognize and to, to see through the eyes of faith, to see by believing what you have said, the heavenly realities that are, that are actually more long-lasting, are therefore more important than the things that we more easily see before us with our eyes, the things that are on earth. Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly see this, to truly understand this, and that by recognizing that our lives are hidden with Christ in God, that us, um, that, that our future, our fate is completely based on Christ and what he has done for us, and to have that be the basis from which we live our lives. Lord, help us to be able to to heed the things that you've said here through the Apostle Paul about prayer and about interaction with outsiders, but to do that motivated by a desire to, or, or a response to these, these heavenly realities that you have, have given us. Lord, I pray that as we fail, which we all will, Lord, that you would forgive us, that you would help us to grow in these areas, and that ultimately we would be able to be a part of the work that you are doing in building and growing your eternal kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.